1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. If you'll stand with me once you find your place. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. We're going to be talking today about God's love and how much He loves us and how important that love is. 1 John chapter 4, let's begin in verse 7. Here it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for, God, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, in that while, or excuse me, toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now let's pray before the message. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you today and we just thank you for your love and we thank you for Jesus Christ and for his shed blood on Calvary and for the salvation that you provided for us. And as we open up your word today, I pray that you'd help us to get, catch a glimpse of your love and, and just what it means to us and, and how we can uh, just... Make that a part of our own lives and, and live for you and, uh, and please you in life. I pray, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts today. If there's anyone here today that has never trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and I imagine that there are folks in that situation, that you'd speak to their hearts about the love of Christ and how much he sacrificed for them and, and how much you did for them through your love. And, and I pray that you'd just reveal your love to them today that they might be saved. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us, and I, I pray that you'd speak through your word today, that the preaching today not be in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but, but Lord, always in, in the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, you'd be with uh, Miss Sachiko as she translates as well, Lord, that uh, every word that, that she says will be exactly what you want it to be. I pray, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts today. We love you, and we commit this time into your hands, and pray that you'd meet with us now. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> in this world that we live in today, you often have to wonder, does anyone really care about you? Does anyone care about the things that are going on? Because people seem to be, in this day and age, people seem to be hopeless and in despair. And, uh, those, those are common symptoms of, symptoms of life in our world today. People seem to have no hope as they go through life. They're worried about everything, and, and there is a lot of uncertainty in this wicked world that we live in. As, as you go out and you look at things that go on, and in America just this week, we've had uh, uh, several killings at, at uh, a couple of universities and just terrible things that go on. But even here in Japan, you're not... Uh, there, there are things, terrible things that happen here as well. If you remember back in the 1990s, there was Aum Shinrikyo that, uh, that attacked the Tokyo subway with the, the sarin gas attack that they did. And then there's the Yakuza over here, the, basically the Japanese mafia that, that you face over here. And then the Bozozoku, uh, the, the younger folks that, that uh, do all their crazy things. And people, are, people worry about those things. And there's not only that, but if you remember just uh, um, when I was here, uh, that we had uh, uh, the North Koreans fired a missile over Japan, and, and there's concerns about that. And then there was the Kobe earthquake, and there's tsunamis and typhoons. And there's a lot of things to be worried about in this world if you'll allow it to get you down. And, and people do worry, and they worry about what tomorrow holds. What, what's going to happen tomorrow? And, and, and there seems to be no hope. Uh, the suicide rate over here, uh, people are always, uh, especially on the Chuo line here, people... People throw themselves in the front of the, the trains and things, and, and, and people have no hope. Well, there is hope today, but, but people in this world without Jesus Christ, uh, uh, this is what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 says about them. It says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And people look for answers to that. They look to, to psychologists and they, they, they take antidepressants and they try and do all these things to, to just find a way to, to dull the pain, basically, of this world that we live in. But if you feel that way today, if you're without hope in this world, then there's something that you need to know about. 
there's something you need to know, and that's that God loves you. God loves you. In this world, everything may go wrong in this world, but there is still a God in heaven that is in control, and He loves you, and, and He paid the price for your salvation and your redemption. You need to know that because when, when you realize that things are in God's hands and, and you put yourself into God's hands, then there is hope in this world. There, there is a brighter side to the life that we, we live in. And even though there may not seem to be hope in everything that goes on outside us and around us, in the city around us, in the world around us, there is hope in Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. In the passage that we just read, if you look at verse 10, it says this, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Ooh, propitiation, that's a big word. We're going to talk about what that means in a minute. But first of all, we need to understand that, that God's love and, and required that he send Jesus Christ to the cross for one reason and one reason only. And that's the first part of that verse there. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. You see, the problem was our rejection of the love of God. That's the problem that's in this world today. That's the problem from the very creation was that, that man had rejected the love of God. And God loved him. He put him in the garden. He, he had taken care of everything. He had provided for him all that he would ever need. But God gave them one rule when they were there in the garden. If you look, uh, keep your place here in 1 John, but turn with me over to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. God created this world, and this world was perfect. There was no sin. Man was created perfect and placed in the garden. And then in the garden, God gave them one and only one rule. Verses 16 and 17 of Genesis chapter 2, it says this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of the tree... Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. One rule. Man, you can go into the garden. Your, your job is to dress it, to keep it, take care of it. But when you're there, there's only one rule. You can eat of any of the trees, but this one tree that I said don't eat of it, I don't want you to touch that one. Actually, he didn't say that. It's interesting. Eve said that when Satan asked her, what, what did God say? She, he said, oh, we shall not eat of it, and ne neither shall we touch it. God never said anything about not touching it. We have to be careful about adding things to the word of God. And when God tells us to do something, we need to stick with what he said and not what we say. But, uh, but he, he gave them this one rule, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that, that was the rule, and they were there. If they had obeyed that rule, everything would have been fine. But then Satan comes to Eve and, and tempts her. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Well, let, let's back up. Let, let's actually look at uh, verse, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? It starts out, Satan is there in the garden, he goes to Eve, and the first thing he does is question the word of God. God had told them, given them one rule, said, this is the rule, obey it and you'll be fine. And Satan said, well, did God really say that? Is that what he really meant? Is that what he was talking about? He begins to question the word of God. Eve's answer is interesting. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may, not, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. God didn't say anything about touching it. She's adding to God's words here. Lest ye die. So that part of it was true. Just she added to it. Verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. First, he questions the word of God. Then she, Eve, adds to the word of God. Now Satan is outright denying the word of God. God said, you eat it, you're going to die. Satan said, oh, you're not going to die. That you, you have to understand why God told you that. He goes on. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now he comes out and just outright lies. 
But really, even in the lie, and, and this is when, when people lie, the most effective lies are the lies that contain some truth. Because what he said there was technically true. You see, when she ate of it, she did know good and evil. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, but it, so what he said, he promised her something, and it was partly true, but it was partly a lie. Those are the most effective lies that Satan uses for us. They're the ones that are partly true. But he said, uh, ye, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The implication there, what Eve understood Satan to be saying, is there's something magical about this fruit, that when you eat it, you're going to magically get the, this knowledge of good and evil. You're, you're going, God's just, uh, he has no control. Once you eat this fruit, this knowledge is going to come into your mind. Well, that was the lie, because there was nothing special about that fruit. That, that fruit was probably just ordinary fruit. There was probably nothing special about it at all. Where the knowledge of good and evil came from was their disobedience in disobeying God. There was nothing special about the fruit but there was something special about obedience. He had been, he, they had been given one rule, and then they chose to disobey it. Look at verses 6 and 7. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be what, desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. So they saw the tree. They, they saw it, was, it said it was uh, good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. And to be desired to make one wise. That, oh, there's some nice things about this fruit. I would like to have that fruit. Even though God said not, I, I don't care what God said, I would like that. They put themselves over God. They disobeyed God, and that disobedience was the sin. They had known good up to this point because they were created good. God had made them good, but now they, they have disobeyed, and this is what happens in verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They, their eyes were open now, and, and it says that they knew that they were naked. Well, that's the way God made them. There was nothing wrong with the, them being naked in the garden because that's how God made them. That's how they, they were. That, that was fine. But now they had sinned. They had disobeyed God, and they were ashamed of themselves, and they wanted to hide and cover up. In fact, they hide in the bushes when, when the Lord comes down and, and meets with them that day, and, and they, they hide from him, and that, that's what that was about. That's what the problem was with being naked is because now they had sinned, and they were ashamed of themselves, and, and they didn't want to show themselves to God or one another, and, and they wanted that barrier there. And, and so they had disobeyed God. That was what the problem was. That's what the problem always is with sin. Essentially, what they said is, is God, I know you said to do the, not, not to take of this tree, and that was the one rule, but I want to do things my way. I've seen the tree. It looks like it's good to eat. I, it makes one wise. All these good things come from eating this fruit, so I don't care what you said, God. They shake their fist at God and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. That is what sin is. And that's what happened in the garden. But then in the garden, uh, you can turn back to our, our passage, but um, in the garden, that's not where sin ended. That's where sin began. It's also interesting. Uh, when, when they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, the, the fruit of the tree there, did they die at that moment? Physically? No, they did not. Spiritually, they did. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there's, uh, when it talks about death in the Bible, there are two types of death it talks about. There's physical death, and then there's spiritual death as well. And, and that it's important that you know that there, there's a difference there. But, uh, but the fact is that, that sin entered into the world in the Garden of Eden. But then sin passed to all men because all have sinned. In Romans 5.12 it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that's by Adam and Eve when they were in the garden there, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, the reason that, that Adam and Eve eventually died was because sin came into the world. If they had, if they had obeyed God, if they had, had just followed that one rule, they would have still been in the garden today and still been alive, and, and they would never have had to taste physical death. But because sin came into this world, there, there was a sp uh, penalty, first of all, spiritual death, and then physical death is the end result of spiritual death. And because of that, death passed to each of us, but so did our sin nature. 
Because our parents were sinners, we are sinners too, and our children will be sinners after us. It, it's, a, it's a hereditary thing. It's a hereditary problem because our parents were sinners, we will be sinners. Hey, have you ever, if you say, you know, oh, well, people are born into this world basically good. Well, go over into the nursery right now and, 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 uh, and, and take all the toys out of the nursery and just leave one toy in the middle of the room and see who gets it first and how much they fight over it. it you, you didn't have to teach those children to be sinners. They know all about that from the day they're born. They're sinners by nature, and, and they'll fight over it. Whatever toy one child has, that's the one that they have to have as well. And, and, and that, that's just, it comes naturally to us. You don't have to learn that. You have to be taught to behave. You have to be taught to be good. It's in our nature to sin. But sin, we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all committed sin in our lives. We've all, uh, none of us is perfect. We've all done things wrong. And, and some of us probably have done things that were really wrong. But, but it doesn't matter how big or little your sin is. The fact is that sin is disobedience to God. It doesn't matter if, if it's just something small, it's still disobedience. I, I was talking with someone the, the other day and, and talking about how, how if you're at work and uh, you take a pen that belongs to the office and you say, oh, well, you know, I could use this at home and everything, and you, you take it home, even if the boss knows about it and doesn't really care, the fact is that that object did not belong to you and you did not have permission to take it. That is sin. You say, oh, well, it's just a little pen, and what does it matter? And, and you know, I, I, I bring stuff into off, the office all the time. You know, I bring in coffee, and I pay for that and everything. So, so they owe me something, and it doesn't matter. It did not belong to you, and you took it. That's sin. And even if your boss doesn't care, the fact is God said not to steal. And so what you're doing there by taking that is you're saying, God, I know you said not to steal, but I'm going to take it anyway because it's not a big thing. And I don't care what you said. That's why it's sin. That's why it's a problem. It's because it's disobedience. It's essentially we have sh shook our fist at God saying, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty, as a, guilty of all. We say, oh, well, you know, I, I may have done something small like that, but I've never committed murder. According to that verse, it doesn't matter what you've done, how bad it is. The fact is that you disobeyed. It, it, it's not how much you disobeyed or in what manner you disobeyed. You've still broken the law. You've still done wrong. That's the state that this world is in, and, and, and that's, that's the, the situation. And you say, well, Brother Bill, I can't think of anything that I did wrong. Well, let me help you a little bit. Luke, uh, in fact, let's turn there. Luke 10, 27. Luke 10, 27. I'm not a sinner. In Luke 10, 27, the Lord Jesus has asked one of the scribes a question and he's about to answer that question. And he's quoting the Old Testament. So this is scripture. This isn't just his opinion. But this is what he says in Luke 10, 27. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. <laughs> Luke 10, 27. It says, and he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, you have to love God supremely. If you have ever put anything before God or thy neighbor as thyself before another person, if you put yourself before them, you've said, you know, oh, well, you know, uh, I, I, I know that, you know, Brother Bob over here, he needs something, but, you know, I need it too, so I'm just going to, you know, I, 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 I could probably do without it, but I want it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it for myself. According to the Bible, that is sin because that other person needs it, and, and we're to love others as ourselves, not, not love ourselves. Now, it's human nature. I'm not saying that you're worse than anyone else. I'm just saying that, uh, I'm pointing out that unless you've put God before anything else in this world, then you've sinned, because that's, he created us. He, he's the one who made us, he, and we're responsible to him. How can we do less than love him supremely? But that's what we do. It's in our nature, because we're sinners by nature. And sin is disobedience. So we have here that, that the rejection of God's love required the cross. But the next thing, God's love provided the cross. 
You see, when we rejected his love in the garden and we rejected his love by, by being sinners and, and living for ourselves, it, it was that rejection and the fact that he loved us that made him send Jesus Christ to the cross. It, it was through love that he provided that. Verse 10 of our passage today, it says, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He, it's because of his love that he did that. We need to understand the love of God. But before we go, in, go much further into the love of God, we have to understand why his love required that sacrifice that he made. It's because there's a payment that's required for sin. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember, I said that we would talk a little bit more about spiritual death versus physical death. You see, it says there that the, the wages of sin is death. What are wages? It's what you earn for doing a job, basically. And, and when, we, when we sin, according to the Bible, we're earning death, a death sentence. There's a death sentence against each one of us. And it's not just physical death, but it's spiritual death as well. Keep your place here in 1 John, but turn with me over to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. It talks about the judgment that is coming on this world. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. It speaks about a throne here. You need to understand, the person sitting on this throne, according to the Bible, is Jesus Christ himself. It says this in verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the, heaven, or the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. In other words, everyone will stand before God one day, and that these books will be opened. And in, in context, what the books it's talking about are the 66 books uh, of, the, of the Bible, that, that the, the Bible will be opened, and, and people will be judged based on, well, did you do what the Bible says? And the fact is, none of us has. But then it also mentions this other book, the book of life. A and according to scripture, the only way your name is written in the book of life is if you're forgiven but for your sin and, and that you've trusted in Jesus Christ as you, the payment for your sin. Because of that, your name will be in the book of life. And those people, uh, all those sins, all the things that they did, in God's sight, they're wiped away. They're forgiven. It's not because of anything good we've done. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done that, that, that that's the case. And, and so we, we have that, that judgment that's coming. And it goes on, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. There is no one exempt from, from judgment before God. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And catch this. This is the second death. This is spiritual death. So when it talks about this death sentence, it's not just talking about physical death. These people have already died. They, they've been dead, some of them, for a very, very long time, but then they're going to stand before God in judgment one day. And it talks about this second death, that if, if, you've, if you've been born into this world and you reject Jesus Christ, then you face this judgment and you face this second death which is the casting into the lake of fire, the casting into hell. And it says in verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, oh, well, uh, that stealing that pen, uh, uh, that's not serious enough for me to be cast into hell. You're not understanding what sin is. Sin is not simply that, that I've taken a pen, but that I've shaken my fist at God and said, I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what sin is, and that's why it deserves hell. And each and every one of us, before we were saved, were headed to hell. But then we understood something, and you need to understand this as well, is that God's love caused Jesus Christ to pay the debt for our sin. In John 3.16, uh, probably the most famous verse in all the Bible, it, uh, many people who have never heard anything about the Lord have heard this verse. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why God sent his Son. He sent Jesus Christ to this world to pay the debt for our sin. And when he was there on the cross in John 19.30, Jesus Christ was, was hanging on the cross, 
he, he was, according to the Bible, he was God in the flesh. And, and, and he was hanging there on the cross, dying, and he said these words right before he actually died. He said, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He died right after that. It is finished, he said. That is actually, in the Greek, it's the word tetelestai. And the word tetelestai is a, is a financial term. When, when, uh, when you had a bill that you owed, if you owed an amount of money and, and you paid it off, they would take the bill and they would write tetelestai. And it was actually just one word. It meant finished. Uh, and that's what, when Jesus was on the cross, he actually didn't say it is finished. He actually said finished. But, but uh, what the word means is, is that the payment had been made in full. You didn't owe anything else. When he said to tell us die, when he said it is finished, he said that sin, the power of sin was broken, that he had paid for sin, that if you just place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that your sin would be wiped out clean forever. That's past, present, and future. That doesn't mean that if I, if I get forgiveness today and I sin tomorrow, that, that I, all of a sudden I'm not saved again. He paid for sin for all time. Let me ask you this. When, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, how many of your sins were future? All of them. You hadn't even been born yet. So to say that only our past sins could be covered by the blood of Christ makes no sense because we hadn't even done anything at that point. It's, it's all sin was paid for at that point. But in verse 10 of our passage today, it, it says this. Uh, it says, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I said we'd talk about what that word means. That's a big word. It, it, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, we come across words in the Bible and we say, oh, what on earth does that mean? Well, it helps to look things up. And what propitiation here means is a payment to satisfy a debt and reconcile two parties. We owed a debt to God. We were sinners. We, we owed that the wages of sin is death. We owed those wages. We, we had been earning this all our life, and we were going to, we were, if we died in that state, we would have to pay that debt. But, but here, Jesus Christ has offered his life as the payment for our sin. When he said it is finished, he had made the payment. He had reconciled man to God. He had made it possible that if we go through him, that we could get to the Father once again. That in the Garden of Eden, that, that fellowship that we had with God was broken by sin. But through Jesus Christ, through faith in him, and through trusting in him as our personal Savior, we can have that relationship once again. And only Jesus Christ could pay the debt for that sin. You see, if, if I were to live a perfect life and then go and die on the cross, in fact, we were just talking about this last night. If, if I lived the perfect life, I never sinned once, never did anything wrong, I might be able to die in the place of one person. Of course, that would mean I would go to hell and then they would go to heaven, but, but uh, my righteousness would be enough to satisfy the law for a single person. But Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, he was God in the flesh. In Acts 20, verse 28, it says this, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Listen to this. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Did you catch that? It was God's blood that purchased the church. It was God's blood that purchased the believers in Christ. It, it was God's blood that was shed on the cross there. Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, was none other than God himself came down to this world, was born into a human body, and, and then lived 33 years here, lived the perfect life, and then shed God's blood on the cross. That's why it's sufficient for all mankind. You see, it, it, one person could die for one person, but God, as the creator of all mankind, he could die for all of his creation. And that's exactly what he did. When he shed his blood, it was sufficient to pay for any and all sin. Some people argue over what, uh, what did Christ's blood actually cover as far as the sins that it covered. Is it just the, the sins of believers? It, was it the sins of all mankind? And, and you're looking at it too small. 
he, he didn't die just for specific sins. He died for all sin, basically as a principle. In other words, if the human race continues for another 10 million years and continues to sin for 10 million years, it doesn't matter because his blood was still sufficient to pay the price. It doesn't matter how much sin there is in the world or how long it goes on for, it was still sufficient. It was sufficient to pay for you. It was sufficient to pay for me. It was suffi sufficient to pay for all mankind. So it was paid in full. God is love, the Bible says. It, and the cross shows just how much. You see, God is love. It, it, it's talking about the very nature of God is love. He created us out of love. He, he created this world out of love. He, he, he provides for us out of love. He, he provided Jesus Christ out of love. And we need to recognize that love. And, and Because if we say that, you know, hey, uh, I know that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died on the cross, but, but I can live a good life. I, I'm a pretty good person. Well, do you know what you're saying to God by saying that? If you think that you can get to heaven on the basis of your own righteousness and, and, and the own good things that you do, this is what God says in Galatians 2, 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, if you can get to heaven because by just being a good person, by not sinning, by, by taking care of your neighbor and you know, doing all the things that, that the law says to do, if you could get to heaven that way, then there was absolutely no reason that Jesus Christ had to die on the cross. And God spilled his blood in vain completely meaningless the death on the cross would be completely meaningless that's what you're telling God if you say you can make it to heaven on your own you cannot because of sin we all owe a debt of sin it doesn't matter what how good how bad we are there's still a problem with sin but then finally uh, the rejection of God's love required the cross God's love provided the cross and then finally we love God because of the cross. Look at verse 19 in our passage. It says, we love him because he first loved us. It's not that we love God and decided, oh, well, I need a relationship with God. It's that God saw us, saw our rejection of our, his love and said, okay, I'm going to pay the price for that rejection. I'm going to go to the cross, shed my blood in order to save mankind. And that, that's what he did. But now when we understand that, when we just catch a glimpse of how much God loves us, how much he sacrificed for us, how much he was willing to give up. He was God, and, and he came down to this, this earth and was born in, in a lowly manger and, and everything he did. And, and then uh, when he died on the cross, how much he gave up to do that, then you can't help but respond to that. If you truly understand it, and, and we can't fully understand it, but, but if you have any kind of understanding of how much God loves you, you've got to do something about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, it says this, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It says that the, the love of Christ constraineth us. It compels us. If we understand what Jesus Christ did for us, then we have to respond. If we don't respond, then, then obviously you don't understand the love of God. If you understand that at all, you have to do something about it. You see, God loves us. And the offer that he made for our forgiveness is the only one that's out there. Uh, no one else died for your sins. Mohammed didn't come and die for your sins. Uh, 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 it doesn't matter. It, no one else did. David Koresh uh, led that cult down in Texas. He didn't die for your sins, even though he claimed to be Christ. And, uh, but, but Jesus Christ is the one who died for your sins. Hebrews 2.3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How can you escape without the love of God? How can you escape without his sacrifice that he made for you? You need to understand the love of God. You need to respond to the love of God. Won't you open your heart to Jesus Christ today? Won't you trust him as your personal savior? In Revelation 3.20, it, 
it speaks of the Lord, and it says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, in context, that verse is actually spoken to believers, but, but it holds true for, for everyone, that Jesus Christ is there at the door of your heart. And he's saying, won't you let me in today? Won't you trust me as your personal Savior? And he's asking for, for you to have that relationship with him. Won't you recognize the love of God? That he's the, all that he's given for you in this world, that he shed his precious blood for you. It, it, we need to see the love of Jesus Christ. And what will you do with the love of Christ today? It's being offered to you. We're telling you about it. God offers it in his word. And all you have to do is receive it. Or do you plan to be one of those who says, uh, and I've heard this before, you know, I'm going to take my chances with a just God. God is just and, and he won't punish things uh, unreasonably and everything. And so how could he possibly cast me into hell? Uh, I mean, uh, God is just, right? Well, justice demands one thing. It demands a payment for that sin. It demands that, 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 that if, if we have sinned, and all of us have, that there is a payment to be made, and that's being cast into hell. That's what justice is. Do you want justice? I don't want justice. I want mercy, because that's what he's offered us in his love. It says in the Bible that, that hell wasn't even created for you. If, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as, as your personal Savior, uh, there's no reason for you to go to hell, because that's not why hell was created. According to Matthew 25, 41, it says this, Then shall he say unto them also, also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not made for man. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. But because man rejected God and believed the lie of the devil and chose to sin and disobeyed God, if a person dies in their sin and refuses to accept Christ as their personal Savior, that's what, where they go when they die. They do go to hell. But th that's not what it was intended for. And you don't have to go there. It's because of your own choice if you do go there. It's because you've chosen to reject God's offer of salvation. Won't you accept the gift of God today? It says in Romans 3.23, for the wages of sin is death. We've already talked about that. But the last part of the verse, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's gift to you today is that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. He paid for my sins, he paid for Rodney's sins, he paid for Martin's sins, he paid for Sachiko's sins, he paid for all of our sins, but he paid for your sins as well. That's the gift of God. But what happens, if, if I were to come to you today with, with a gift, I say, you know, uh, um, Brother Rodney, this box of tissues is a gift for you. Notice, he has to accept it before he has it. Uh, I, I can't give it to him if, if he refuses it and says, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want it. You know, you have to receive that gift. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He's offered you salvation. He's offered you everlasting life, eternal life. But you have to receive it. You have to say, Lord, I, I realize that I'm a sinner. I'm undone. I deserve hell. I, I've disobeyed you. I've shaken my fist in your face and and. and and because of that, I deserve to go to hell. But I know that you, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to pay for my sins. And right now, as best I know how, I, I accept you as my personal Savior, and, and, and I ask you, to, won't you save me today? And, and, and I trust you that, that you paid for my sins, and, and I'm asking you to save me. God's promise, in fact, let's turn there. We're, we're, we're done here in 1 John, so turn with me over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We'll look at these verses, and then we'll be done for, for today. We'll have our invitation. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. It says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So right there we have just what I was describing. You're calling out to God saying, Lord, I, I, I need to be saved. Won't you save me today because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for me? Won't you save me, forgive me of my sins, come into my heart, be my Lord? 
That's what those verses are talking about. But the interesting thing, it's not the prayer or the words that will save you. There is nothing magical about a prayer. What will save you is the belief in your heart, believing on Jesus Christ. That's, that's how we're saved is we trust in him and we believe in him, believing God's promises. And let's take a look at what the promises are. Uh, look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved, not could be saved, not really ought to should be saved, but shall be saved. It's a promise of God made a promise there. And how can God lie? If, if he could lie to us, then he wouldn't be God. He, he, because of his very nature, because God is love, because God is just, because God is holy, because of all these things, who God is, he cannot lie to us, and he has the power to fulfill any promise he makes. And so when he says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that's a promise from God, and you can take that to the bank. If he promises you today he'll save you, then you can rely upon that. So why don't you accept the love of Jesus Christ? Why don't you realize what, what he did for you and say, Lord, I want to accept you today. Won't you be saved today? Every head bowed and every eye closed. And stand to our feet. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the love of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross in our place. He didn't have to go to the cross. But out of love and an understanding that if he didn't go to the cross, we could not be saved. He did go to the cross and he shed his blood in our place. He shed his blood in my place. He shed his blood in each of our place. And Lord, help us to catch a glimpse of your love today. I pray, Lord, that every person here that has never trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal today, Savior, that today, that, that you would speak to their heart, that, that you would just reveal your love to them and show just how much you love to them and, and what you did for them, and that they might trust in you as their personal Savior today. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, before I finish my prayer, I just want to ask a couple of questions so that I might, I might better pray for you. No one looking around. Let me ask you today, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? Not based on, oh, I feel like it, or I'd like to go there, or, but based on the word of God that you know what you've done. You've, you know that you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know you're going to heaven when you die. If that's you today, would you raise your hand? Amen. Hands across this room. Many, many hands. Amen. You can put them down. Amen. Then let me ask this. Maybe you couldn't put up your hand right then. Maybe, maybe you're here today and, and you say, Brother Bill, I, I don't know the love of God. I've heard about it, and I would like to know the love of God, but I've never trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. If that's you today and you'd like me to pray for you that God would, would show you his love today and, and, and help you to trust in him, if that's you today, would you raise your hand? Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Amen. Amen. I don't see any hands, but I, I have to think that there probably are some folks here that, that are not saved. And, and if you're not saved today, you can be. When, when we give the invitation, which sim simply means that we're inviting you to come down to the altar to pray for whatever you need to or or whatever the case may be, if you come down here and get my attention, I will have someone take you into a room and, and show you from Scripture how you can know for sure you're saved. It, it's not a question of being good or being bad or anything like that. It, it's simply a question of, of trusting God and believing his word. Now, I, I won't ask any more questions today, but if, if God spoke to you about anything or Maybe you, you're concerned about a loved one that doesn't know Christ, but whatever the case may be, if you need to come and pray today about anything, uh, you, you feel free to do that once we finish, the pr finish praying. But let's continue. 
Father, uh, Lord, I, I saw no hands today saying that they're saved, or that they're not, anyone is not saved today, that, that there's anyone here that hasn't trust, trusted Jesus Christ. But, Lord, I do think that there probably are some. And I pray that you would just speak to their hearts, Lord, that you would not let this day pass without them getting saved. Lord, we've cried out to you all this week, and we, we've committed this day into your hands. And, and Lord, we pray that you'd work in hearts. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with each one here today that is a Christian and, and help us to share the love of God with this lost and dying world. Help us also to catch a glimpse of, of the love of Christ and, and, and may that compel us to greater service to you. Lord, we love you and we pray that you'd be with us in this invitation. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. The altar is open. If you need to pray about anything, you come right now. If you need to be saved today, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm not asking, ha have you been in church? I'm not asking, have you, have you taken sacraments? I'm not asking about anything, but has there been a time in your life when you saw yourself as a sinner from the Word of God and you called out to Him to be saved? Called out to Jesus Christ. That's what I'm asking. If you can't think back on a particular time and place and date, you, you may not remember what the date was. That doesn't matter. You might not be able to tell the specific place, but, but you remember what happened that day. You remember that you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you had that relationship with him established once again. Not through a preacher, not through a priest, not through a church, but through Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. To get to God, you have to go through Jesus Christ, for he is God.